Hello everyone and welcome to Tudor Terrific. Today I have the TI-84 Plus CE calculator to do a tutorial for you. This will be like a beginner tutorial to show you the basic ropes and get your head around this thing and how to use it for basic stuff. Um, this calculator is very well sought out for these days. If you're not willing to switch to the TI Inspire, this is kind of the uh, most recent uh, high-end, high-tech version of the TI-84 lineup. And so I think it deserves a tutorial like this. So before we get started pressing buttons, I want to show you some basic hardware stuff. This calculator is a rechargeable battery. And so on the side, you have your port. Now you're going to get with the calculator a mini USB cable and an adapter. So don't lose those because mini USBs is kind of outdated and you're going to need to uh, charge this every now and then. Once it's charging and you've plugged it in properly, this orange light will uh, shine to let you know it's charging. Rechargeable batteries are in here, and using rechargeable batteries, of course, allows this to be a lot thinner than the uh, older versions of the TI-84 Plus, for example. Um, note also that on the back side, this might come in handy to you, a reset button. That reset button will allow you to reset all the settings as if it was brand new out of the package and kind of get you out of a sticky situation in case there's something wrong with the calculator. Okay, now uh, the cover also, uh, it comes with a cover. Mine is used, so ignore the scratches. But that allows you to protect the thing. You can turn it upside down and slide it into the slots. Uh, for better protection and keep that case with you by turning it over and sliding it in. If you're familiar with any scientific calculators, you're well aware of that for all of them. Okay, let's get to some button pressing. We're going to uh, press the on button to turn this thing on down here. And the first thing I want you to notice is that this is backlit. So I can turn all the lights off and you can still see the screen just fine. Now oh, don't worry, I won't be working like that because it's uh, quite hard to see the screen without the backlight. And uh, this is an LED display. Now there's another older TI-84 that is LED display as well, but just note that it has backlighting in case you have a power issue or a lighting issue. So that is a nice feature, but it definitely uses a lot more juice. And so a rechargeable battery is a nice feature for these. Notice also, if I put this closer, the uh, battery level indicator. Currently it's all the way up with that nice green bar. As you deplete the battery, that green bar goes down, becomes red, and eventually it depletes altogether. It's just a hollow red battery icon. And uh, you need to get that thing charged quick. Make sure it's nice and charged before you go on a test, or if you have to go away and study and you forget the cable. Uh, don't get caught in a situation where you're about to take a test and this thing dies on you. Uh, you can't just put new batteries in it because it's not that type of battery. So just word to the wise, don't lose your cable and charge it frequently. Okay, so to turn it on, press the on button like I did, and uh, to turn it off, we activate this second button here. So the second and alpha, if you're unfamiliar, are buttons that allow you to access more features without having to add extra buttons on the user interface here. If you want to activate any of the blue words or features, you press the second button and you press the button underneath that feature. For example, if I wanted a square root, I would press the second button and the X squared. But I want to turn the calculator off, so I'm pressing second. And also I wanted to point out, did you notice how the screen went dim but not completely off? That's a feature. I think after about 30 seconds of idle time, it's going to go to that dim setting to save battery. And then after a, a brief period more of not touching it, it will turn completely off. Oh, it'll go to sleep, we say, uh, just to save that battery for you. So nice features to help you prolong the life of this thing. Now I've got second, uh, I've got that selected. You know it is selected because there's an arrow in the middle of your blinking cursor. So if I press any button, it will activate the blue text above it. In this case, off. So that's how you turn your calculator completely off. If we turn it back on, I want you to notice something else. All these words at the top. 
So all these words at the top here are some of your settings, important settings in your calculator that is currently set at. I'm going to show you next how to get to those settings, okay? And that's called the mode menu, a very important menu. Think of it like your settings menu for your calculator. If we open that up, we see all these different settings, not the best display, but it's kind of a classic display for all the TI-80X series. So uh, each row is a setting. For example, the top one, which isn't blinking right now, I'm gonna move this blinking cursor down with the down arrow. As you can see, uh, I've got multiple settings here. Um, the top setting is an important one. It's how you want to view your expressions. Do you want to view them in the math print mode, which was made famous by another scientific calculator in TI's lineup, the TI-34 multi-view? or the 30SX2 multi-view. It allows you to see equations and expressions like you would in your textbook. Or you can switch that to classic mode, which is more of the classic Texas Instruments interface, uh, which doesn't really have some of the nice features of making exponents really small or numerators and denominator type fractions smaller so that one can be over the other. Uh, if you don't like that, for example, and you want to switch a setting, note that the setting that's currently selected is the one that is in black. It's highlighted in black with a black background. So if you want to switch to something else, for example, I want to switch to classic mode, come up here and move the cursor over to the right so that classic is selected and press enter. Now note that classic itself is uh, highlighted instead of math print. And I want math print because I think it's far superior, so I'm going to select that. There's lots of other settings here, such as the type of angle unit we're using, uh, the type of uh, graphing we're doing, uh, what type of uh, coordinates we're doing, and uh, many other settings that we might or might not get into. All right. To get out of the mode menu, you could do two things. You could press clear, or you can press a more important button that we need to learn called quit. If I press second, then mode, notice over here, since it can't really show me the arrow here, so it would obscure what I'm highlighting, it puts the second here so that I can know that the second has been selected. So if I press mode, it's going to activate quit, which is gonna get me back to my main uh, operation input menu uh, window, okay? So that's the mode menu. You're gonna be in there quite a bit, adjusting modes depending on what class you're in. Let's do some simple arithmetic. Checking order of operations works. Let's try five plus nine times three. Should it do the multiplication first? Yes, and we should get 32. If it does the addition first, we would expect to get 42. So let's see what happens. Perfect. As you would expect, order of operations is done and loaded in here correctly. Okay, we can also do division on this calculator. Eight divided by five, for example. It's gonna show it like this. There's ways to get that to be uh, changed, and we'll look at that later. But you would expect 8 slash 5 if the division symbol is used to mean divide by 5, and that is exactly what you get. You get 1.6, which is 8 divided by 5. So arithmetic operations are actuated with these buttons over here. Plus, minus, multiply, and divide. Okay. Now... One thing that's really nice about these features, uh, these calculators, is that you can recall your previous entries for a long time. Now, if, uh, before I show you that, I just want you to show how you can clear your palette here, in case you don't wanna see anything, just press the clear button. Now, if you wanna see your previous history of calculations that you've done, you just press the up arrow. If you press it once, you see the previous answer. If you press it twice, you see the previous operation that got you that answer. And if you keep going up with the up arrow, you go one line up in the past to your previous calculations. Let's say you wanted to uh, uh, do one of those calculations again, but you didn't want to type it all out. For example, six minus i times six plus i. I'll talk about i later. If it's blue and highlighted, if you press enter, it will bring it down and make it your new expression that you want to evaluate. And if you press enter, it will evaluate it again. Okay, that's a great tool. Now, another great tool for recalling old calculations you've done is a uh, second entry. Now, as you can see, my previous entry was this. 
6 plus i times 6 minus i. If I press second and then the entry button, see how it's entry blue above the enter, it's going to recall that previous entry and allow you to do it again. And if I press second entry once, it recalls the previous transaction. If I press second entry again, it will recall the next one in the list up. If I do it again, it's going to recall my previous one, which as you saw was eight divided by five. And you can keep pressing second entry over and over again to get a more previous uh, calculation that you've done and press enter to evaluate it. Pressing clear will clear this out so that we don't see all that anymore. Another useful feature is the ANS using the previous answer. Let's get our five plus nine times three back, our 32. Now let's say I wanted to do some stuff to 32. Maybe subtract six times nine. Notice how I started writing minus six times nine and it already put this ANS there. That ANS represents my previous answer. That's 32 loaded into the calculator. So we'd expect 32 minus 6, 26 times 9. Oh my gosh, a big number, close to 260. Oh, no, it's going to do 6 times 9 first. Silly me, I forgot order of operations there. It's going to do that 54, and it's going to do 32 minus 54. Silly me. So that's the calculator checking me on my bad order of operations. All right, if we clear that, I want to show you how you to get ANS without having to type some operation first. You can, right, currently the previous answer was negative 22. You can recall that a different way. You can press second and then the negative sign. That negative sign is different than the minus sign, okay? If you press second negative sign, you see ANS is up there. What it has just done is load that negative 22 that we previously got as an answer. And now I can do something to it, such as add 5 and get negative 17. A useful feature, but that will only recall the very last answer you got. Nothing previous to that. Okay, now what we're going to do next is we're going to look at some other operations that are a little bit more complicated than just your basic add, subtract, multiply, or divide. For example, let's look at things that uh, are here. Like, for example, I already mentioned the square root. If I wanted to take a square root of something, I would uh, write the uh, second and then see this x squared button. If I press that, I'll get the square root. And then I'll type in what I want inside there. And you notice I type a number. I'm still inside the radical symbol and I can add more things as requested by myself. Or if I wanted to get outside the radical, I could press the arrow when I'm at the end. See how it's got an arrow blinking? It says, if you click it one more time, you're gonna get out of the radical. And now I can do stuff outside the radical if I so desire. Okay, so that's the square root. The square button is, <laughs> Uh, that same button, but you don't press second first. So let's say we've got, uh, let's see, what's a nice square, uh, perfect square, 49. So if I've got 49 here and I want to square it, all I have to do is press X squared. And then we have our X squared, 2401. Now, what if you wanted to uh, do a different square, uh, different square root, so like a, a root to a different power, a different degree of root, or a different degree of exponent rather than two. Well, there's a couple ways to do that. If you want uh, the um, uh, a number to a higher power other than two, you can press the number you want to raise to the exponent, and then come up here to what's called the caret button. If you press that caret button, you can add any exponent up in this space. Notice how I've moved to the superscript of the three, I've moved to that position. And so I can put, you know, anything I want in there. Obviously I wouldn't want to calculate that. It's going to be crazy. But for example, three to the sixth. Notice that when I press the arrow once after putting my exponent in, it gives me this right arrow saying, if you do it one more time, you are going to get out of the exponent position into the main level position. Maybe you want to add something. 
But if you wanna go back and change the exponent, you can do that by pressing the back arrow, the left arrow, until you get back up there into the superscript position. And let's say you wanted to change that exponent to be not six, but six minus five. Now at any point, no matter where you are, your cursor, your blinking cursor is in your expression, you can press enter and it will evaluate it just fine. We'd expect that to be nine. Three to the six minus five power, three to the one power is three plus six is nine. I didn't have to move the cursor to the end of the expression. I'm gonna bring this back down like I taught you before. I didn't have to have the cursor here in order to evaluate it. It's the same answer. So just, you know, less clicks, less clicking of different things saves you time, especially if you're on a timed test where you need to get through it to make sure you get the, the best grade you can. You wanna save clicks for sure. Okay, so that's uh, raising to any power. We can also uh, do, uh, if we're gonna do things to any power, we should also look at scientific notation things times 10 to a power, okay? So let's do that now. The button to get uh, 10 to the X is a shortcut here. You see how it's uh, the second of logarithm, L-O-G. So generally speaking, you can press second log and then it shows 10 to an exponent. Notice how I didn't have to type in the 10. For example, 10 to the eighth, press enter, get 100 million. Now, if you use this, you're most likely using it for scientific notation. So I wanna show you there's two ways to do this. You can use this button or the double E button here. So let's say you wanna write something in scientific notation and see what it looks like in standard notation. 9.2 or 9.36 times, and then press second log to get that 10 to the, and then for example, 10 to the nine, it's gonna, output the standard form of that number with all the place holding zeros, which scientific notation likes to avoid. So you can see what that actually equals in standard notation. Now you don't actually need to type the multiplication to do this. 9.36 and then skipping the times, you can go straight to the 10 to the, with the second log, and type that same exponent, 9, and look, press enter, you get the same result. So you actually can skip that, which is kind of nice. It's a time saver. Now there is another way to do uh, scientific notation, and it's a shortcut. It's a couple less buttons to press, and that's by actuating this double E here. So let me show you why this is useful. 9.36, instead of going to second log, we're gonna go second comma, okay? Now we're going to type the same exponent. Now what we've done here is we've written 9.36 times 10 to the nine. That E represents times 10 to the, okay? So far we haven't saved much of any steps, but this is useful because if you type in something massive, you're trying to get the calculator to do something massive and it doesn't have enough digits to do that in standard notation, it's gonna give you the answer in scientific notation. For example, this massive product here, Notice the answer is 1.47580667 E17. You have to understand that and interpret that to be, for example, if I round this, 1.48 times 10 to the 17. So the calculator uses this notation when it spits out big answers. And so you need to be aware of that. And it also does it for really small answers. Okay, it'll just have a negative number there. If the number is too small, for it to have enough digits to write it in standard notation. So that's why I like using double E. When I was in physics in college, I just used that because I liked the notation better. It was less clunky. You just have to get used to it. So those are two ways to do scientific notation. And if we could do things raising to the power of 10, we should be able to do raising things to the power of E, okay? And there's a button for that. It's second LN, which stands for natural log. E to the five, for example, is done that simply. Press enter and you have E raised to the power of five. So that's a way to deal with E. Now, in addition to that, there's also an E over here. You see on the division, 
symbol. So I can press second, divide, and I just get e by itself. If I don't want to raise it to a power, but I'd like to like multiply it by three, I can do that with that button. You can't do it with the other one because it's expecting an exponent. You'd have to put one in there if you just meant to deal with e by itself. Okay, let's also talk about the inverse operations to these exponential functions, the logarithm and the natural logarithm. So the logarithm is this base button here, 10, uh, underneath the 10 to the x. You press that log, it shows you log with a parenthesis. Let's put what we want to take the log of. Let's do something nice that will give us a nice answer, 10,000. So as you know, logarithms uh, spit out the exponent required to turn 10 into this number you plugged in. That should be a four. And we get a four like we expect. So note that the log button defaults to base 10 logarithms, the common logarithms. If you want to change the base, there's ways to do that with a special menu, which a little too advanced for what we're gonna to do today. Or you can use the change of base formula, which I can go over in another video. Leave that uh, note in the comments for me if you wanna see that. And another important uh, logarithm is the natural logarithm. So down here we see our ln. So I type that, it's gonna tell me what exponent I have to raise e to to turn it into what I plug in. Two is a very important number. What power do I have to raise e to to turn it into the number two? 0.693, a very important result used all the time. You see that all the time in math and physics and etc. So there's your natural logarithm, your logarithm. And now what I wanna show you is a little bit of memory features on this calculator. What I'd like to show you now is how to store a value as a variable. Let's say you've got this number uh, 10, and if you're in physics, you know how important that number is, or 9.8 for you who have a little bit more accurate number, uh, the acceleration due to gravity. So let's say we wanna store that so we can use that all the time. Let's say we want to store that as g, which is how you see it in physics. How do you do that? Well, you press, you put the number in that you want, and then you press the sto, which is a store button. Notice that when I press that button, I get this little arrow here, which says, what would you like to store that as? Well, in the, the alpha menu, I'm going to press alpha, and notice the cursor has a blinking a in it. That lets you know you're on the alpha menu now. It's gonna actuate any of the green buttons above uh, the buttons you see. So we're looking for G, which is above the tangent button. So if I press G now, G shows up there. This is going to store 10 as G. If you press enter, you get the result 10. But the idea is every time I type G, it's going to understand that as 10. Well, let's see if it does. Alpha, G. I type G and I press enter, boom. It spits out 10, saying G is equal to 10. I can also do things with G for multiply by five and then subtract six. What should I get? 44. Five times 10 is 50, minus six is 44. So it's using G in calculations. Let's say you forget what you assign to a variable. How can you recall that information? Well, there's a button for that. Press second, store, and you see RCL there. RCL shows up at the bottom, so it doesn't get in the way of what you're doing. Press alpha and G. It's going to tell you what G means, 10. And notice how it puts it up there for you so you can now use it to do things you might wanna do with it. So that's an interesting memory feature that you might find useful if you use the value over and over and over again throughout a class or a homework assignment or even a test. Now, how do I uh, work with the memory? I've got all this memory here, all these things I've done. Let's say I've, I'm running out of room. My calculator's telling me memory is getting full and these calculators do have finite memory. How do you deal with that and get rid of that uh, or clear your memory to give you room on your calculator to do more stuff? Well, there's this memory menu down here. If you press second plus, you get to this menu, okay? The about just tells you about your calculator, but two tells you uh, your memory stats. 
if I press enter there, look what it tells me. It tells me how much RAM is free, okay? I think that's measured in bytes. So you got about 152 megabytes, 153 megabytes free of RAM. Now come tell me in the comments if I'm wrong about that. So uh, there's lots of different types of memory and programs as well. It's gonna be a big one if you're downloading games and you can clear all of these or any of these at once. Uh, let me show you how to clear them all because that's probably something you're gonna do more than anything else. To get out of this menu, we can press second quit or clear. Go back to the memory by pressing, pressing second plus. And now look down here at three and four. Three is going to clear entries, all the uh, calculations you did on the main window. And number four is gonna clear all lists, which we haven't got into because lists I think is gonna be its own video if you're doing stats. Let me know in the comments if you wanna see that video. So if we press three, or enter when three is highlighted, we get this. Now there's nothing more we need to add. We haven't done any clearing of memory yet, but if I press enter, I've cleared my entire memory of all the entries into the calculator, okay? So what happens when I scroll up to look at my history? I see one entry and that is that I cleared everything. So next what I'd like to show you is the math button. This is a button with a lot of sub menus that you're gonna use quite a bit and some basic stuff you need to do on this calculator. The math button is right here and if you click it, you get this. Now these capital letters are sub menus with things underneath them and you're gonna use potentially quite a bit of these things uh, throughout all of your math classes or your mathy science classes. Uh, let's start with the first two buttons in the math set menu, fraction and decimal. These allow you to convert what you have to the opposite type. For example, a decimal to a fraction, number one, and a fraction to a decimal, number two. So if I type uh, go back to the main menu and I type a fraction that I have here as a decimal 2.58 Okay, and I want to see that decimal as a fraction I'm going to type the math button and then either type the number one or press enter when one is highlighted like this And then it populates that on the main entry screen and this is going to convert 2.58 to a fraction and there we have, and it's gonna reduce it as much as possible, okay? 129 over 50. Now, if I wanna see that 129 over 50 as a decimal instead, just for simplicity, I'm gonna highlight and enter it. So now I have a fraction, I wanna see that as a decimal. I'm gonna press the uh, math button, go down to number two, press enter, or just press the number two. Now we have 129 over 50, number uh, arrow des, which means I'm gonna turn this into a decimal. And there you have the result written as a decimal. Really useful, it's right there. It makes it easy for you to convert between the types. I know other calculators that are scientific have a little double arrow button here, which allows you more quickly to do that. Um, yeah, they just didn't have room on this calculator. There's really not a spot for it to get this nice design they wanted. So that is one really important feature of the math button. If I clear this, I wanna show you something else in here. And the shortcuts for cubes and cube roots, huge, you use those quite often, almost as much as squares and square roots. So they're down there in the number three and number four positions on this menu. So let's say I wanted to cube something, three cubed, for example. All I have to do is type three and then math three, and there it is. I like how they made it math three, that makes it easy to remember that that's how you do that shortcut. Of course, you could do the carrot and the three button with no extra steps, but you might forget about that carrot button. The math three, I have a feeling you're gonna remember more. What if you want to cube root something? You're gonna press math four, and now you have the cube root. The radical works the same way as the square root that I showed you earlier. You can type some stuff in here, and if you wanna get out of it, you have to press the left arrow, on the, uh, sorry, the right arrow, and the left arrow will get you back underneath it. So I can now add something in there since I'm now back in there. And uh, whether I'm in or not, I can press the enter sign and get the same result. So that is the cube root feature. 
really nice and handy because those are used all the time. Next, let's look at the uh, next thing in the math section I wanted to go over, which is higher order roots. So higher order roots, number five there, as I said before, I can do higher degree uh, roots, like fourth root, fifth root, etc. But what I have to do first is I have to input the degree I want to do. For example, let's try the fifth root of 32. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, type that degree first and then press uh, math five. And notice how it puts it right in the degree position, which is really kind of cool. And then you can type what you want inside there, the radicand, and press enter. And you get what you'd expect, which is a two. So that's how you can do higher order roots. Another important thing that you use all the time, absolute value. So we go to the math menu, and now we're going to scroll over with the right arrow key to the number menu, and we'll see ABS first. It's not anti-lock break system, that's absolute value in short. Now if you press one on it, or you press enter, sorry, press enter if you're on one, or just one, no matter where you are, you get this in the entry screen, and this is meant to be absolute value of, and now we can put what's in there. I'll try negative, 14. By the way, if I haven't mentioned this, uh, negative symbol is here, the minus sign is here, and you can't mix those up or you'll get a syntax error. And I press enter. Whether I'm inside the absolute value symbols, those vertical lines or not, it will uh, work and it will enter the proper uh, expression and evaluate it as 14, which it should. So that is a good uh, feature, whether you're inside your uh, function or not, you can press enter and it will evaluate as if you're not intervening at all. Okay, now uh, another thing I wanna go over are some of the combinatorics uh, functions. Uh, for those of you who are doing permutations and combinations, you'll need to know how to do uh, NPR, NCR, and just simple factorials. So let's say I wanted to find uh, 8 factorial. And if you're not familiar what a factorial is, you're just taking a number and multiplying it by every positive integer less than it all the way down to 1. So a factorial would be 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So that's a lot to write out, especially with larger numbers. And so there's got to be a shortcut for that. Well, if you type the number you want to do that with, you go to Math, and you scroll over to Probability, and you press 4 or highlight 4 and press enter, you see an exclamation mark, that's the symbol for factorial in math, and you just press enter, and there we go, 40,320. That's 8 factorial. So that's how you do factorials. And back to this menu, uh, NPR and NCR. So let's say you want to do 12P3. I'm not going to teach you, you know, what this means. It's kind of assumed you already know what we're doing, we're taking 12 objects and finding the number of ways to permutate them taken three at a time. So if we go down here, type enter at two, you'll see you get a spot to put something, a P, and then a spot to put something else. So we're gonna take the total amount N of our list, put that there, and then hit the right key once, and now we'll get to the R position to put how many things we're taking at a time. And uh, notice how I'm still down there at the bottom. If I want to do something else in this expression and I want to like add something to this whole 12p3, I need to make sure I'm not still down there. I have, I have to click right because if I don't, look what's happening. I'm still, I'm changing my r value. I can clearly get out of hand and make r bigger than n, which is not allowed. So go back here, delete that if you've accidentally do that and press the right key. Now you can see the cursor uh, is full size. So if I wanted to do anything additional like add six, now would be appropriate to do that. But I don't want to do that for this. I just want to press enter and get my 1320. If I want to do NCR instead, go back to the math menu, go to probability menu, NCR, which is three. Click that, now I'm finding the ways to take three objects uh, from 12 uh, without worrying about order. So we're going to get a smaller number here for 12, choose 3, 220. So those are where those functions are for doing any combinatorics. Now, one other thing I want to show you are some of the features of the fraction submenu in here. Go back to math. 
And if you go all the way over to fraction, notice how I did click the arrow four times to get over there. There's a better way. This is a revolving uh, menu that you can go through in a circular sequence. So I could go backwards one left from math and get to fraction as well. Just, you know, finding ways to reduce the number of clicks is always good. So the first two allow me to create fractions of these types. The first one, number one, that's numerator over denominator, a traditional fraction, and uh, improper fractions are also allowed. And then un over d is a mixed number. So if I type a one, it's gonna show me this, which is nice. I can do what I did before, calculating eight over five. Now I know it's a little hard to see. Uh, I've got, I'm in the numerator right now and um, I am typing things in the numerator. If I want to get to the denominator to type a five down there, I have to press the down arrow just once. I type the five, now I'm still in the denominator. If I want to get out, notice what's showing in my cursor, a right arrow, click the right arrow once, and now we have our fraction. What this is gonna do if I press enter is just retrieve the same fraction. It's not gonna do what it did before when I typed eight divided by five straight into the entries and gives me a decimal. So just realize that, but don't worry. You can select this, press enter, and then go to the math menu and press two. Now this tried and true fraction is going to turn into a decimal. Let's just keep that in mind. Now, if I want to write out a mixed number straight away, go to the fraction sub menu, press two. Now you can see I've got the whole number in front one and three over five. This allows me to uh, write a mixed number. It's gonna put that by default into improper fraction form, okay? Just keep that in mind. Some other things in this submenu is this, the F to D. Let's see what this does. Let's see if you could imagine what this is going to do, okay? So first I'm gonna go populate the entry with something. Let's do this, okay, one and three fifths. And let's type that button, three here. Look what it does. It changes it from a fraction to a decimal. Now what I'd like to do is see if it will switch the form back from decimal to fraction. Let's click the same button, fraction submenu, three, and look what it does. So whatever form it's in, it will change it to the other form. If it's a decimal, it'll make it a fraction, n over d type, so if the numerator's larger, it will be improper. Or if you have a fraction, it will turn it into, whether it's improper or a mixed number, it will turn it into a decimal. So that's a useful feature if you just wanna get from decimal to fraction and vice versa. There's more in here, and that is the final button I haven't gone over, number four which turns a, uh, a numerator denominator type fraction into a mixed number. So if I have eight fifths here, plug that here, type that last one, four, boom. So this is all of the features in the math button window. You're gonna be using that a lot. Now, what I want to show you, and it's very important in equation-based operating systems that there's some system for this, is to edit your expressions before you enter them. Maybe making a correction of some kind so you don't have to re-enter everything. Let's say you had, like I've done before, five plus nine times three, and you're like, no, I want to fix that, and you accidentally press enter. Oh no, I have to write the whole thing again, right? Wrong. Go back up, select, your expression, okay? If let's say you wanted to add a negative in front of the three, remember that the negative sign is here, the minus sign for subtraction is here. Don't mix them up or you'll get a syntax error. What I wanna do is put a negative right in front of the three. There are two ways to do that. First thing you can do is go to the three, make sure it's the cursor's on top of it, and you can type negative three. So now, instead of rewriting the entire expression, I have now just changed a part of it, okay? I can go back even farther. If I go back farther, what you have to realize is what I'm doing is overwriting. 
So it's going to overwrite what's currently there. Let's say I want this to be negative nine, not nine. Well, what it's gonna do is put a negative, if I have the nine highlighted, where the nine was. Now there's no nine there. So I'm gonna to have to type the rest of this expression that I want in order to uh, get the entire negative sets that I want, negative nine and negative three. There's a better way to do this. It doesn't require you to rewrite half or all of the expression. And that is the insert feature. So let's put our entry in again. Let's say I wanted that to be negative nine and wanted this to be negative three. Scroll over to the nine. Don't start writing a negative. Instead, press second, delete. Look at what's happening now. It's not the normal cursor anymore. It's an underlying cursor instead. It blinks to an underline, underscore. What you will do now is type something and it will put it in front of whatever's blinking. So see how it added a negative in front of the nine without erasing the nine. This is not overwriting. However, it will revert back to the overwriting style if you do anything left or right with the, the cursor. Notice now I have a regular blinking cursor. If I press a negative now, it's gonna replace the times with a negative. So if I want to insert a negative in front of the three, I will put the cursor on top of the three, press second, delete. Three will now be blinking with the underscore, press minus, sorry, press the negative sign. And then you could press enter, of course those negatives cancel out and we get 32 again. If you have an extra digit instead, Let's say you did five plus nine times negative negative three. Oops, I didn't mean for that extra negative to be there. Scroll over to the digit or symbol you want to delete and press regular DEL and it goes away. Now this next feature, you may be doing this a lot or you may not, has to do with uh, complex numbers, fully complex numbers that have imaginary parts, such as dealing with I, which is the square root of minus one. If we want to uh, call i into our entry, it's down here. It's the decimal point's second. So for example, if I press second and the decimal point, I get a little i there. That is not like all the green letters in the alpha mode, in the alpha menu. It is i, the square root of minus one. If I multiply it by two, we would hope to see two i. That doesn't prove what I'm saying, but it does make it in the format of a complex number that we like to see, which is what it defaults to, a plus bi. Now, uh, I can do any of these operations that we've seen before, arithmetic, adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, with i, just as we would and we learn in our algebra classes. So let's add two complex numbers together. Six plus three, I, and I'm using that traditional format of real plus imaginary part, A plus B, I. And I'm going to add to that 9 minus 6, I. We would expect it to add like parts, real parts together and imaginary parts together. And look, it does that, 15 minus 3, I. Okay? We can also do multiplication or division, which really shows that it knows what I is. Let's do a division problem where it becomes very evident. I'm going to go to the math menu and I'm going to set up a nice fraction so you can see what you might see in your math books if you're asked to divide a complex number by another. So let's do a 5 minus i in the numerator. Press the down arrow to get to the denominator. And then um, I see there's a glare here. So let me move that over slightly. Sorry about that. Let's refocus. 5 minus i over 3 plus 3 I. Notice how I always press second decimal to get the I. And whether I'm in the denominator or not, I can press enter and it's going to evaluate that as it should. Two thirds minus I. You would get this the same way by doing multiplication of the complex conjugate of the denominator, as you may have learned in your class for algebra. Notice how it gives the answer in the A plus BI format. B in this case just happens to be one. So very useful, very, very beneficial. You can also do exponents with i. Let me clear this. I can take i here and raise it to any power I wish. And if you're familiar with imaginary numbers, you know that i, the exponents of i are cyclic in multiples of four. 
So we would expect, for example, i to the 26, since that's two after a multiple of four, to be the same as i squared, so it would be negative one. And there it is. So this calculator has a full set of features to make use of all operations that you'd need with i, the imaginary number. There is one window associated with complex numbers uh, in the math menu. It's a submenu of math called complex C M P L X. Now there's some really cool features here. We're going to go through two of them together, the real and image. Okay. If I click real and I type a complex number into it, six plus 17 I, for example, uh, and press enter, by the way, you may have thought, do you always have to close these parentheses? No, it won't give me an error for syntax when I don't. It just assumes it's closed. It gives me six back when I press enter, and that's just the real part of this fully complex number. And I, I shouldn't say fully complex. All numbers are complex, but this has a real and imaginary part. Next, let's go back to math, and let's go to the complex submenu again and click image for imaginary, okay? Let's type that same imaginary number in. This time I'll close the parenthesis. I'm OCD and I like things to be closed because sometimes we need to add more on to our entry, including division. So it's good to practice putting those parentheses closed. But in this case, it doesn't matter if you do or don't. What this is gonna give me is the imaginary part of this complex number. 17. It spits out the B of your A plus BI. Notice it doesn't put the I with it. So the next thing I'm going to show you guys is graphing. This is a graphing calculator after all. So where are the graphing buttons and how do we do some basic graphing on here? Well, they're up here at the top. Okay. To enter a function to graph, we have to go over to the Y equals button and press that first. When you do that, you might see some preloaded fractions that were there from the last time this was used. If you don't want those, and you could press clear when each line is highlighted in some way. You can go down and up to get to each and every uh, y equals position. Now, why are there more than one? Well, you can graph up to 10 things at the same time. In addition to plots, which again has to do with stats and lists, and comment below if you want one of those videos for me to go over that. I'm not gonna go over that in this video. Okay, let's say we just want to graph a simple linear function, x plus 3. y equals x plus 3. Well, the y is already there. The independent variable is already there. But how do I get the x? The dependent, sorry. The dependent variable y is already there for all these functions. How do I get the independent variable x? It's this button right here. And that will put, be an x if you're in the function mode on the calculator, not the parametric polar or uh, whatever that other one is. I don't even know. Um, so if we're in the function mode, second quit to get out of this, y equals to go back to where we were. When you type that button, you get an x. Okay. Let's say we want to do x plus three, type that right away. If you want to quickly figure out what that looks like, we press graph. It loads it on the screen, which is kind of nice from left to right, as if you were graphing it yourself. And notice how it graphs is a blue thick line. Those settings can be changed. If we go back here and we scroll to the right two buttons, press enter, now we can adjust the color and the line thickness or style. So let's turn that into a light blue line and we can change the line style to be thick dots, for example. Press the down arrow once to, press, uh, to okay these changes. Notice how it looks different over there. So now if we press graph again, it's graphing thick dots and a blue line. The reason it looks thicker is because these thick dots are really close together. But that is my line that I just graphed. Now I can graph more than this on the same graphing window. We can go down here and let's say we want to graph good old parabola x squared. So type x and then the squared button to square my previous entry, x squared. Press graph again. We've got a normal thickness line. We've got that beautiful x squared parabola showing up. Now you may have noticed this, but the, there's some distortion 
in that y versus the x-axis. Notice how the x-axis tick marks are more separated than the y-axis tick marks. This is so you can fit 10 above and 10 below the origin in the y direction and 10 to the right and 10 to the left in the x direction. You get the same number of tick marks, they're just not able to be as separated because this is not a square. Well, there are ways to change that if you uh, prefer to see a different number of tick marks or different uh, part of the Cartesian coordinate plane. And that is done through two different windows. First, I'm gonna show you the zoom window, which lets you adjust a zoom for what you're seeing on the plane that's graphed. And one feature, of course, is to zoom in. If we press two or enter when two is highlighted, we go back to the main window, nothing's happened yet. But if I want to zoom, I press enter again. Notice how, I don't know if you can see it, let me get this closer. Notice how the uh, there's a dot blinking in the middle. I can adjust where that is if I so desire. That just where the zoom is centered, kind of like if you're doing transformations, the center of your dilation. So I can adjust that if I so desire. Uh, normally, you just want that in the middle uh, of your screen, so at the origin. If we press enter, it's going to zoom about the origin. And so we're looking much closer. You can notice uh, that there's only like two tick marks in either direction showing up now. Let's say you wanted to zoom out. You press zoom again. Since we're zoomed in, if we press three, it's going to zoom out back to what it was originally if I press enter. There we go. Now let's say you didn't want this distortion. If you go to a window, here is how you can adjust the distortion. But let me explain what you're looking at first. You are given the uh, leftmost X tick mark, the rightmost X tick mark, so the far left to the far right, as far as the value of each tick mark is concerned on the screen, how they increment how much you add to the previous tick mark to get the next one from left to right. And then the lowest tick mark on the y-axis, the highest tick mark on the y-axis, and how they increment. So this is basically your standard setup. Negative 10 to 10 with an incrementation of one each. And that's fine, and that gives you that distortion, but it gives you the same number of tick marks. So if you want to remove that distortion, what I found works well is negative 6 y min to positive 6 y max. Notice how when I started to type at the beginning, it just erased, it just populated, erased the previous entry for that and put a 6 in place, even though there were two digits before. So if I click graph now, it's going to keep those settings. Notice how the tick marks are about as spaced out on the y-axis now as the x-axis. So it's a useful tool for you if you do not like the distortion and you want to see things more uh, Standard. One more zoom feature I want to go over for you is uh, standard zoom. This is going to reset all the settings for the window. It's going to erase all the settings we did and put everything back to negative 10, 10, and 1 as far as the min, max, and the uh, incrementation on the y axis. So let's press 6. As you can see, now we're back to what we were before. If we click window, everything's been reset. So that's an easy way to do a reset. There's also a trig zoom if we want to zoom so that we can see standard tick marks for trigonometric uh, graphing, which would be your uh, half fractions of pi, much better than one, two, three, etc. That's how you get that. If I press that now, it's not going to do much that means anything to you, but we'll get to that when we're doing some trig function work a little bit later in this video. All right, now, trace is an important button to know. It's right here. If we go trace, what we're doing is we're currently going to follow one of these functions and see what its values are. Notice how there's an X value and a Y value for the current position that's highlighted. If I scroll to the right, it's gonna follow the function and tell me what value that pixel is on the screen. So for a lot of the time, these won't really follow the nice values you might've hoped for when you're on a grid on your paper.
but it gives you the idea of where you are on the graph. If I want to switch between graphs, so if I want to be on the parabola instead, I'm going to click the down arrow. You see how the numbers are now red. My second function is up there, and now I'm following the parabola around. And I can go left and right. Thankfully, it does give you <laughs> that value, the origin, really nicely. And you can follow that guy up and see uh, the values at certain spots. Maybe see how X and Y vary together. But there's a much more useful feature than just randomly going to different parts of the function, and that is second trace, which gives you the calc menu. If I type second trace, I get here. I can calculate a value anywhere on the graph if I so wish. For example, if I'm on my first function, which it will default, see, y1, if I would like to calculate a value for something, I can uh, pick uh, a particular spot for which I want to be to the left and right of, and then uh, I can adjust uh, my boundaries. So I have selected a left bound. You see the arrow shows, that's my left bound. I'm gonna be picking a value to the left of that. And I'm gonna scroll up here, just an arbitrary distance, and it's asking me what my right bound is. I'm gonna press enter. And so it's got a, a cursor and a little line there. And what it's doing now, if I press enter again, is it's going to tell me, this is my first error message for you guys, that there's no sign change. Calculations are not detecting a sign change to give an estimated result for the allowed number of iterations. So what it wanted me to do for this value window is it wanted me to calculate basically where the sign changed for the dependent variable. Now, there's a much easier feature. We're going to erase that whole part where I talked about the calculate value. We're going to skip that. I'm going to show them something more useful. So if we click second calc and we go down to this zero menu we've got a really really useful tool to find the roots or the zeros of a function now let's do a zero for the blue function okay y equals x plus three what you want to do to find a zero find where it crosses the x-axis first notice how it says left bound what we're going to do is we're going to move our cursor until we're to the left of that spot where it crosses the x-axis. Look at me holding it down and it's sliding on by. So once you know you're to the left of that spot where it crosses the x-axis that you're trying to calculate, press enter. Notice how it gives you an arrow and a line. You're going to find a zero to the left of this line. Now, let's go, when it says right bound, we're gonna move up beyond the zero we want to calculate to the right of it and press enter. Now it gives me a right bounded arrow, which means I'm finding a zero in between these two arrows. All I have to do now when it says guess, which I, I don't like, it's actually trying to calculate it. I just don't understand the software that says guess. But anyway, press enter again. It finds that zero perfectly and it gives you the coordinates of the zero x equals, sorry, negative three and y equals zero. So you got a coordinate point of negative three, zero. So that's a very useful tool for sure if you're doing some advanced algebra or even calculus, you want to know how to calculate those types of things. But maybe you wanna calculate something else. For example, a minimum or a maximum. See down there, uh, menu option three for a minimum. Now on the linear function, this doesn't mean anything, but on the parabola, you can see a minimum value at the origin. So we're going to press down to get to the uh, parabola function, y2 equals x squared, and we're going to put our cursor on the left side of that minimum, somewhere to the left of it, and press enter. And then for the right bound, we're gonna move past the minimum, somewhere beyond it to the right of it, and press enter. And then, as you might have guessed, we're going to press enter again. It's going to find the smallest value between these two bounds. And there it is. Notice what you get. You don't get zero, zero like you'd expect. You get these weird 
uh, scientific notation numbers. But notice what they are. They're extremely small, 1.56 times 10 to the negative 6. It's like one <laughs> a millionth. And then you've got 2.436 times 10 to the negative 12. Okay, those are basically zero. And it's a little glitch in the system that they just haven't figured out after all these years. Even the TI-83 Plus did this. You just assume when it does that, that that means zero. Okay, if any of you have more insight on that, that'd be awesome to know. You could do lots more in this menu, the calculation menu, including find a derivative, so slope at a certain point, do an integral if you're doing calculus, and you could find where two functions intersect. And I do want to show you that because it's a little different the way you uh, show uh, what you, the buttons you press. So let's press five. So what we want to do is select our two curves. If you have more than two curves, or two graphs, you need to select which two you want to find the intersection of. So we only have two. So I need to press enter and then the second curve. Well, I only have one more to pick from. So I press enter and then I press enter a third time and it's going to tell me the intersection. And it's picking one, picking the one that I have to be, that I have to be closer to the two positions where I selected enter before. And it gives me the exact spot where they intersect. Uh, if I wanted to find the other intersection up here, press second calc and then intersect, we need to move our cursor on the function close to that spot, at least closer than the other intersection, so that it will know that I want to find that intersection instead. It will move you straight vertically, not horizontally separated, but straight up and down to the other function, press enter, press enter again. Notice how this time it found the closer intersection and the coordinates are listed below. Of course, if you picked black as your color on the Y equals menu, some of this stuff would show up a little bit better than it does. The numbers would be a different color. But that is some of the basics of graphing on this calculator. Last but certainly not least, trig functions. Basic things you need to know how to use on your graphing calculator. Where are the uh, trig functions? Well, I'll get to that. But first, I want to go to the mode menu and show you the two types of angle units you have. Down four levels is radian and degree. So currently, it's in radian mode, which will calculate, if you're doing any trig functions, it will assume all the inputs to them are radian measures of angles. If you wish to switch that to degree, you'd have to uh, slide over here and press enter when degree is highlighted and blinking. Now, anything you plug into a trig function, it will assume it's a degree angle. So we'll keep it on that for now. Second, quick to get out, it will save all your setting changes. Let's do sine of 30 degrees. So where are the trig functions? They're right here, these buttons right here, and they're inverses not their reciprocals, their inverses are the seconds, second buttons, okay? So let's do sine of 30 degrees. I do not need to find the degree symbol anywhere. It assumes that this is degrees. I do not have to close the parenthesis. I will just for good measure. And I get what I'd expect, one half, okay? If I wanted to do a reciprocal trig function, the cosecant, the secant, or the tangent, what I have to do is I have to do the reciprocal of the trig function, literally, in the calculator. There are several ways to do that. I'm going to show you the non-confusing way as far as notation. For example, let's do the cosecant of 30, which we'd expect to be 2. What we're going to do is we're going to write 1 over sine of 30. And that will evaluate the cosecant of 30. There is no button here for CSC. There is no button. Doing inverse sign is not cosecant. So don't assume that those are the same thing. They're, they're exactly not, okay? If I want to find, for example, an inverse trig function and I actually know what I'm doing and I want to find the angle for which the sine value is one half, I would type second sign, okay? 
And that second sign now gives me inverse sine. So I'm going to type the value of the sine for that angle. And it's going to give me the angle as the output, of course, in degrees, because I am in degree mode. If I switch back to radian mode in the mode window and press second quit, and if I do inverse sine again of 0.5, it's going to give me the radian equivalent of 30 degrees, pi over 6, as a decimal, an irrational decimal. But we can verify that that's equal to pi over 6 by clicking the pi button here, second caret, divide by 6. What do you know? Pi over 6. So good to know where that pi is, now you know. Now that we're in radian mode, I can deal with pi and use these beautiful pi's instead of decimals. Let's say we want the cosine of pi over 2. Cosine, second caret, divide by 2, close the parenthesis if you want, press enter. We should get 0, as we'd expect. So these trick functions can take, uh, their domains are infinite, all real numbers, they should be able to take negatives and positives. Of course they do. Tangent of negative pi over 4. Okay, notice how I put a minus sign in here. I want to show you what happens. Error syntax. Okay, you cannot mix negatives and minus signs. If you want to fix something, if you get this window, you go back to it by pressing 2. And it will show you that entry that had a mistake. It will show you the character will be highlighted, blinking, that caused a problem. And you can adjust it by overwriting it with what you want, which is a negative sign. And you get negative 1. So that's it's the inverse and regular uh, trig functions, okay, and their reciprocals as well. If you want to graph something that is a trig function, you can do that, okay? We're just going to adjust the zoom before we graph it. Let's say you just wanted to graph a simple sine of x plus 2. When you're graphing, it's best, oops, we didn't want to do that, so we're going to override that and put plus 2 outside because I want to raise the whole graph by 2. When you're graphing, it's good practice to be in radian mode because the zoom trig feature assumes you're in radian mode and creates good pi over 2 fractions, uh, well, pi over 2 uh, multiples as the tick marks, which is what you want in radian mode. So we want to make sure in radian mode before we graph or it's going to be really stretched out and you're not going to know what's going on. So we've got that here. We're in radian mode. Go to zoom and press 7 or go down and highlight zoom trig. Okay, you can see your beautiful graph there. And the tick marks are pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi, 5 pi over 2, etc. the other way. The uh, y-axis tick marks are uh, integers, 1, 2, 3. And you can see how this sign graph, because I moved it up 2, is centered at 2 on the y-axis. It actually goes through it, too. So that, my friends, is graphing with trig functions and all the trig function features that you might need when you're getting started. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. I know it was quite long. Leave in the comments if you want further, you know, more specific videos on a certain feature. Happy to do that for you. I want to serve you guys because you guys watching this, hitting the like button, subscribing serves me as well. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. This is Falconator. Signing out.